Hi, good morning, everyone. This is Leia with Headwater Science Institute, uh, joining you for lunch with a scientist today with Dr. Adam Cornish. Hi, Adam. How are you? Hello, everyone. So Adam uh, is joining us from Baltimore, Maryland, and he is a program analyst in the Office of Agricultural Policy at the State Department. We are so excited to have him talk today. He received his PhD in biochemistry and molecular biology from Michigan State University, where he focused on biohydrogen production and investigating enzymatic mechanisms. Since attaining his doctorate, he has performed research at John Hopkins University, engaged with students as a science educator, and he runs programs in the office of the scientific director at the National Institute on Aging. So in his current work, he focuses on tying science-based guidelines and outcomes to important policy decisions, especially those rooted in reducing the impacts of climate change and encouraging sustainability. Which brings us to our focus. Uh, Adam, I understand today you're gonna to talk about modern agriculture and tell us a little bit about what's on our plate. Uh, that's certainly my hope today. All right, well, I will let you take it away. Thank you so much, Leah. Good morning, everyone. So as Leah has uh, told you, I'll be discussing modern agriculture. Um, and so to start off, I actually have to give a small disclosure, and that is the information, views, and opinions in this presentation are mine alone and do not reflect the position of the United States government or Department of State. They make me say that. So if I say something accidentally, they, uh, I don't get in any trouble. Well, they don't get in any trouble. I'll get in plenty. Um, but let's talk about the, what the State Department is very, very briefly. Uh, the State Department is the foreign affairs agency for the United States government. Um, and what they do principally is they are the ones that issue all the passports and visas. So when you decide to travel outside the country and need to obtain a passport, uh, the Department of State is who you're actually speaking with. They also engage in diplomacy with uh, foreign partners, so other countries around the world. And then there's international engagement. So that goes beyond just speaking to other countries, but also all the international organizations that uh, help uh, affects a lot of the change and really drive conversations around the world. And so, but what are they actually, what is the State Department actually talking about? And so it's a huge range of issues. There's economic policy, public health, denuclearization, peace treaties, trade discussions, human rights. If you've talked about this with your friends or seen it on the news, the State Department has someone who has engaged in this discussion at some point. So um, moving away from that, I want to bring up one of my favorite things in the world, and that is questions. I absolutely love questions. I ask them all the time. It drives everyone in my uh, immediate vicinity up the wall because I just am asking questions about everything. I'm going to be asking questions for you guys to think about as we go through this presentation. And what I would love is if you were to uh, think of questions that you'd like to ask me um, and bring them up at the end of the talk, okay? Um, in addition to questions, I'll, I'll admit something that I love even more is food. Um, and so I want you to, you know, we'll start talking about food and we'll start talking about what this thing is. Here's your first question. What do you call this? And so I'm sure you all have things that immediately pop to mind. It could be a burger. It could be a Whopper. I'll tell you guys, this is a Whopper. Um, it's gross. Some people don't like this kind of food. Um, and it, hey, maybe it's food. But one thing that you might have guessed is that this is actually an impossible Whopper. And so what you may have heard of this, um, this is actually a burger that does not have any meat in it or any animal products whatsoever. It's completely plant-based. Um, and so let's talk about the impossible burger just a little bit. Um, so it's got an ingredient label because it is a product. And so it has to have ingredients that are listed for the American public. And so it's really tiny. So I wrote down some of the top ingredients. We've got soy protein, coconut oil, sunflower oil, potato protein, yeast extract, food starch. This sounds kind of weird and maybe even a little bit gross to all of you. Um, so let's look at some other ingredient labels. Here's an ingredient label where you've got sugar, flour, niacin, reduced iron, thiamine mononitrate, riboflavin. Can anyone guess what this particular food might be? Um, 
Probably not. I can tell you that if I just saw this, I wouldn't know. This is the ingredient list for an Oreo. Um, here's another ingredient list. Got a lot of things. Water, sugars, glucose, fructose, sucrose, aspartic acid, histidine. You may have heard of some of these uh, in some of your biology classes. And I'll tell you that this is an ingredient list for a banana. So just because the words don't necessarily sound appetizing doesn't mean that the food can't be delicious and nutritious for us. Uh, but that's not the focus that I actually want to bring here. What the focus I want to bring is that all of these various components are used to make a, ver a substance that seems a lot like meat to our, uh, when, when we eat it. The texture is very similar to meat. But all of these things by themselves would not seem like a good meat substitute. The part that makes it a good sub a meat substitute overall is something that I've underlined here, which I understand is hard to see, called soy leg hemoglobin. And I'm going to blow that up so you can see it a little bit bigger on this next page. So soy hemoglobin. Um, this is a picture of an e of extracted and collected soy hemoglobin. And you might notice that it looks a little bit like blood. And that's actually the point. This hemoglobin um, tastes and has the same red coloration as blood because that is one of the primary components of blood that gives it that very red quality and that, that taste that we get in a lot of meats and other animal products. But the most important thing about this is that this is not derived from an animal. Soy hemoglobin comes from soybeans. Now, I'll tell you that it doesn't come from someone taking a soybean and mashing it up and extracting the hemoglobin because there's just not enough. It's not rich in hemoglobin in the same way that blood is. So how did so how have these uh, makers of the Impossible Burger been able to get so much soy hemoglobin? It's through yeast, actually. What they did was they took this yeast and they genetically engineered it so that it produced soy hemoglobin. So that wrap your mind around that for a second. Scientists took yeast, put in a gene for soy hemoglobin, and then produced uh, like gallons, barrels, tanks full of this yeast, grew it up, and then extracted the soy. And the reason that I'm bringing, that I'm talking about this is because this is my entry point to talk about genetic engineering. Products of genetic engineering are often called genetically modified organisms or GMOs. And so I'll be using that term throughout the, throughout the rest of the presentation. And I just wanted to make sure that you had that um, in place. Now, you might have some really good questions about genetic engineering and GMOs. And I can tell you that um, a lot of people in my life certainly have them because I talk about them a lot. Um, some first thing I'd like to note is what they are not. They are not pieces of produce that have been stitched together in some weird way. They are not some strange algamation of a vegetable or a fruit with some kind of animal. Um, and it's certainly not taking produce and uh, sticking it full of syringes and injecting weird chemicals into the food. That is definitely not what GMOs actually are. Um, and what we're going to discuss as we go forward is what GMOs actually are. But I think the most important question to start off with is why do farmers and food makers actually think that it's a good idea to be using GMOs? And to talk about that, we have to talk about why, uh, um, why food is being produced in the first place. It's to feed people. Um, food is a very intimate part of our lives that sometimes we don't think about necessarily in a deep way because all of that effort, all of that level of work is a little bit separate from many of us, at least from me. I live in the middle of a big city. I don't typically uh, engage with um, agriculture in a direct way because I don't have a field in my backyard. Um, and so we don't necessarily always think about this in uh, a concentrated way. But right now there are a little over 7 billion people that live on this planet and we're trying to feed all of them. And some people are definitely malnourished. Um, and part of that, a small part is the fact that 30% of all crops are actually less lost every year. Um, good portion of the reason for that loss is diseases to plants. You may know that um, many crops especially are susceptible to different kinds of diseases, to insects and to weeds. Um, the presence of these things all reduce the yields of the crops that we could be getting from our uh, current systems. But let's think about this for a second. If we go back to 1960, there were 3 billion people on the planet then. And if we look at today, there are uh, over 7.5 billion people. 
the amount of food that we were producing in 1960 was mostly sufficient to cover 3 billion people. And in the span of 60 years, as our population has more than doubled, we have kept pace. Then the ability for us to produce food has more than doubled as well. And as we think about extending into the future to, to 2050, when we're going to be over 9 billion people, we have to think about how our, uh, our agricultural systems continue, need to continue to improve to be able to feed all the people on this planet. So I'd like to talk about animal, uh, the annual U.S. production of several different kinds of crops very quickly over time. And so what we have here is pounds or bushels of rice, wheat, and corn per acre starting uh, back in the 1800s and extending into today. And what you'll notice is that over the last 100 years, we've seen more than a doubling in the amount of these crops that we've been able to produce per acre. Um, just looking at 1962, um, we were producing about 4,000 pounds per acre of rice. Today, we've more than doubled that actually, because these numbers only go up to 2016. Um, we're producing more than 8,000 pounds of rice per acre up, up just for rice in this country. We have had substantial gains. But how have we gotten here? How have we been able to get to the point where we are be able to produce more of these crops? And I'll tell you that the answer is not just GMOs. There's so much more that's going on. Um, there's a deep ag history. And on this slide, you, can, you see two different plants. You have Tiacente and modern corn. And so you'll notice that they might have some similarities. You know, the leaves look a little bit uh, similar. They both have about the same height, at least in this picture. Um, and they produce something that has some grains. Um, but you'll notice that Tiacente has a much smaller grain size because right here we have it compared to a quarter. Whereas here, um, the corn has a much larger grain size, again, compared to a quarter. And the thing that you may uh, already know is that Tiacente is technically the uh, ancestor to modern corn. Over time, Tiacente was uh, domesticated and bred to have uh, certain qualities that we now associate with modern corn. But how did we actually get here? And I can tell you, it, did, it wasn't overnight. These hard little kernels of Tiacente, which I'm, I'll admit I have no desire to eat, are now these larger um, juicier, more flavorful kernels that we have in corn. This took about 10,000 years. It wasn't overnight and it took a lot of work on um, many, many generations of farmers and other agriculturalists to get to this point. So I want to take a very quick a step aside as we talk about how we've gotten to this point and talk about selective breeding and specifically in dogs. All dogs are related to, to wolves. They are exactly the same species. Um, but what has happened over time is as humans have domesticated these, these wolves to be more dog-like, we have emphasized the traits that we want in that particular dog by breeding these dogs together, selecting for the ones that have the traits that we care about and breeding those together successively over many generations, leading to schnauzers and pugs and Great Danes and Chihuahuas, all looking very different, with very different traits, yet all coming back to that same ancestor and all technically being able to breed with one another. And talking about being able to breed with one another, that's because they have a common gene pool. In some of your science classes, I'm sure you've talked about genes, which are the source of hereditary information in our bodies that actually de uh, determine all the physical traits that we then uh, exhibit and show. And so if you look at an entire population of the species, you can look at all the possible genes that could be resulting in a variety of different traits. And so here we see the, this representation of all the possible traits that lead to all of these different dogs. And um, I bring this up because uh, this is actually how it works in plants as well. So taking a hypothetical situation where we have some ancestor of um, carrots. If you look back 10,000 years at carrots uh, that were, are in the wild, you would be surprised at the variety that you actually see them come in. They are purple, they're brown, they're white, they're orange, they're big, they're small. Some are tasty, some are not. Some have really uh, uh, are not good for you to eat. Others are very nutritious. 
And what these early farmers did was they found the ones that they liked, the ones that were tastier, the ones that had the higher nutritional content. And they started breeding them together. So they breed these two varieties together. And then they look at the resulting generation. And the resulting generation has a mixture of the traits of the two that were bred together. So they're not going to be uniform but they would then select the next round that have the traits that they want and breed those together. And by doing this successively over time, they were eventually able to get to consistent crop varieties that are uniform in the traits that are actually being desired. Um, and so this has enabled us to be able to get this domestication of crops that we, we use today. Now, one thing that is kind of interesting is we can actually have a, a very um, close modern day equivalent where um, uh, an example where we have mustard plants. You may have seen these on the side of the road. They're not that large. They're like maybe two feet high at the most, little yellow leaves. You'll see them on walks. You don't think that much about them. But through selected breeding for very specific traits, we've actually been able to get six different modern varieties of produce uh, that are based on uh, that are all actually the same plant and same species. They're all mustard, but um, kale, cabbage, Brussels sprouts, broccoli, cauliflower, kohlrabi, they have these very different traits that are all coming from the same gene pool because it's all coming from the same species at the end of the day. Now, um, what's interesting is these uh, different varieties can actually be bred together. You may have seen broccoli flower, where you get the green quality and some of the flavor of broccoli with the, the same basic shape as cauliflower. And this is something that a lot of plant breeders and farmers have taken advantage of over time. So this is what this is called is cross breeding. What we have here is an example where you might have two tomatoes, one that is heat tolerant, able to be out in the sun and not wilt, but it doesn't taste that good. Meanwhile, you have another variety of tomato that's super flavorful, but the moment it gets above 80 degrees Fahrenheit, whoop, it's wilted and you're no longer going to get a good crop. So what developers have been able to do, what these plant breeders have done, is they've crossbred these uh, varieties together to eventually achieve tomatoes that are both heat tolerant and flavorful. And so this is an example of crossbreeding within, within the same species, taking advantage of those genes within the gene pool and bringing together those that, that allow for the traits that are most desirable. But question, what happens if those traits that you want aren't actually in the uh, gene pool at present? Where can you get those new genes from? Where are those new traits going to come from? Well, sometimes you can have, you can expand your gene pool by breeding organisms that are closely related to one another. So on the left, we have a sweet, orange, which you're all probably very familiar with. And then on the right, you have a pomelo. Um, I'll tell you, I've never had a pomelo. They're native to China and I've never had one. And I don't think I'd want one either. The rind is really, really thick and hard to get through. And then the fruit inside, the flesh inside is actually really, really tart and bitter. But there was an idea. They knew that or oranges and pomelos were closely related to each other. Could they potentially be bred and achieve a different kind of fruit? Can anyone guess something that looks maybe like an orange and has some sweetness, but is also tart like the pomelo? Well, if you guessed the grapefruit, you were right. Grapefruit are not native to, uh, to any part of the world. They are the result of crossbreeding between oranges and pomelos, taking advantage of genes that were outside of the sweet oranges range and introducing those to obtain a new product. And so this is crossing with a closely related species. So this is one way that breeders can get new traits that they might not have access to otherwise. But what if there's a trait that's completely outside the gene pool? It's not in the same, it's not in the species that you're looking at. It's not looking at closely related species. Using our dog analogy, what if you want to get a unicorn horn on that dog? You're not going to, you're not going to find it. That, that gene is not present anywhere. Similarly, you're not going to get wings growing at a dog. You just don't have access to those genes. So how do we get there? Well, a method that uh, plant breeders have been utilizing for actually close to 100 years now is something called mutagenesis. So mutagenesis is direct damage to DNA. And what this direct damage typically does is it causes alterations or mutations in the sequence. So here we have T-A-A-C-T-G-C-A-G-G-T. -G 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 but 
with mutagenesis, you've changed a single base pair from thymine to cytosine. Now this might have no effect on the organism. It might have a huge effect. Maybe it has something intermediate. It's hard to predict with mutagenesis because um, in this particular case, it's completely random. But this has actually resulted in some really cool um, uh, products over time. What we have here is a picture of actually a test site in Japan, where here at the very center of this test site is a strongly uh, a strong radioactive source. It emits high levels of radiation. And uh, plant breeders have planted all different kinds of crops in uh, circles around this point source. Now you notice that right close to the source, everything's dead or most everything's dead because the amount of uh, DNA mutation that is happening due to the uh, very strong radiation is killing the plants. But further out, they're receiving less radiation and so the rate of mutagenesis is lower and so they might be able to find some new traits that they hadn't observed previously. Um, and then this is just a graphic of the types of crops that you will find on the market that have, that have been generated in this way. Um, and you can peruse that at your leisure at another point. So uh, uh, we have a new grapefruit. Uh, this is actually the grapefruit that I associate most closely with that word. It's ruby red grapefruit. Um, but I can tell you, this was not obtained through any kind of breeding. Um, and as you can probably guess based on my previous slide, how did you get from grapefruit to, to ruby red? Mutation. They, they conducted mutagenesis experiments and one of the products had this bright red color and this slightly different taste and they seized onto it. And they said, this is a new variety that is exciting, we'd like to use this. And so by introducing new mutations, you can possibly bring in new traits. And this technology is still used to some extent, extent today, but it has been disfavored slightly because uh, ultimately you're getting new traits, but they might not be the traits that you're looking for because it's untargeted and it's unspecific. Let's use an example of soup very quickly. Um, when you're making soup, you really wanna make sure that you know what you're putting in there. But let's say that you have a bag beside you that's full of random ingredients and you just start reaching in and throwing them into the soup. So you might grab a strawberry and throw that in, or chocolate, or feta cheese, that might actually be good, or, you know, uh, stick it notes. Um, you, you're adding things to the soup that you were not necessarily planning on. And you might get something that complements it really well and makes it super tasty, but that's going to be rare. It's not something that's going to happen uh, in, a, um, in a targeted way. You don't know what you're getting necessarily. So um, this has been a valuable tool to expand the gene pool, but can we expand the gene pool in a more targeted way? And so that's when we start talking about genetic engineering. On the left, you, we talk about conventional breeding, where you have crossbreeding between perhaps a virus-resistant plant and a high-yield crop, and over many generations, you eventually get the plant that you want. Whereas with genetic modification, what you can do is you can directly take that gene from the virus-resistant plant, put it into the high-yield crop, and suddenly you have what you want in a much faster and targeted way. Uh, so that is the overall point of genetic engineering. So I'm gonna just cover very briefly some of the uh, ways that uh, genetic engineering has been utilized uh, across the world to get plants with advanced qualities and traits that farmers would actually like to use. So uh, one variety is cisgenic. So cis, uh, the word cis actually comes from Greek, which means on the same side as, and the way we use cis uh, most of the time is to talk about things that are similar to one another. So in this case, this is a transfer of a gene within its species. So uh, in the example here, we have a potato that is susceptible to disease. You have a resistance gene from a resistant relative potato. You put it into this potato, and now this potato is resistant to that disease. And this is just some examples where you have the non-GE potato versus the GE, and you can see there are dramatic differences in the ability of the plant to resist disease. Um, there's also transgenic. So trans comes from Latin and it means on opposite sides of, and we typically use it to mean the word different or dissimilar. And so many transgenic organisms um, are designed where you've taken a gene from a 
just from a from an organism that is not closely related and put it into the target or organism that you're interested in. So in this case, we have um, a gene from Bacillus thuringiensis, a bacteria, and you take this Bt gene and you put it into eggplant. Um, this particular gene produces a uh, protein that is toxic to many kinds of insects. And so if you put it into the eggplant, you can see that these uh, non-GE eggplants have been infiltrated and attacked by different kinds of insect pests, Where, whereas this GE eggplant is, has been resistant. And what's really good about all of this is it means that you do not have to put in, uh, use near the same level or amount of insecticides. In uh, India alone, uh, ins insecticide applications have been reduced 70 to 90 percent when GE eggplant has been utilized in fields over the non-GE variety. So most of the examples that I'll be giving you going forward are transgenic. And so I just want you to remember that you're taking a gene from one organism and putting it into another. Um, you may have heard about herbicide tolerance, and that is where the the crop that you have has been engineered with a gene from elsewhere so that it is resistant to a particular kind of herbicide. So on the left, we have uh, no weed control, no herbicide applied. Here we have with weed control because at the end of the day, the GE crop is resistant to the herbicide. So you can spray the herbicide in a less targeted manner and still eliminate all of the weeds that are present. This, uh, the applications, these types of uh, GMOs have actually been able to reduce the amount of pesticide use um, in, within the United States to a dramatic degree. So in, on the, uh, the blue and green bars overall just represent the total amount of pesticide that's being used. And the line is called EIQ, which stands for Environmental Impact Quotient, which shows the impact that um, the growth of agriculture has on the surrounding environment. And with the reduced amount of pesticides that are being utilized, this has actually reduced the impact of agriculture on the surrounding environment, and uh, vastly improving the sustainability of uh, agriculture when these applications are used. Um, shifting topics very slow, not topics, but talking about another application for uh, GE crops is in addressing micronutrient deficiencies. So here on the left, we have signs of vitamin A deficiency, which includes dry eyes, night blindness, acne, delayed uh, growth, dry skin, um, and can actually lead to blindness if you do not uh, obtain a, um, un, enough vitamin A in your diet. You may have been told by your parents at some point, hey, eat your carrots, it's good for your sight. That's true. Actually, the reason that carrots are so orange is because vitamin A itself is orange in color, and that is where the color of orange com uh, of carrots comes from. Um, eggs are another good source, and there's other sources in your diet for vitamin A. But there are some parts of the world that don't get ready access to a diverse diet like you and I might have. There are some parts of the world where really the only thing that they're able to eat is rice or um, other types of staple crops that are rich in carbohydrates, so they get many calories, but not that many nutrients. So developers have actually worked to do what, uh, to uh, enable biofortification in some of these staple crops. So on uh, in this image here, you can see regular uh, white rice, and then you have rice that has been biofortified with vitamin A. This rice is actually called golden rice because of the color. And uh, especially in the quantities that it, uh, this is eaten in other countries, this can be sufficient to, per, uh, to give people the necessary levels of vitamin A that they need to um, not suffer any of the negative effects of um, the vitamin A deficiency. Other products that are being developed and possibly being uh, given throughout the world is orange maize. So right here we have regular corn. And then these are uh, ears of corn that are biofortified with vitamin A, giving them this orange color. Similarly, there is a root that is used in uh, many different uh, countries in Africa uh, as like a staple. It's called cassava. And we have regular cassava, which is white, and then vitamin A fortified cassava. So this is another use of uh, genetic engineering um, uh, 
for advancing our crops and giving them new traits. So we have a range of options with these, uh, with these GMOs. And I'm not going to go through all of these, but these are just some of the different crops that are being produced around the world and what that genetic trait that has been introduced actually allows it to do. Um, and more are being developed all of the time. Uh, and what's really most important is making sure that farmers and consumers, people like you, have a range of options to uh, choose from so that if a farmer decides that they want to be able to use a genetically engineered crop, they have the access to do so. Um, whereas also, they can, they can um, have conventional crops as well. It's about giving them the choice that they would really like to, uh, the, giving them the choices so that they can make those important decisions. Same for you. It's important that you be able to have a range of choices to um, uh, go to the store and say, I want some of that, I don't want some of that. And that's really what I, um, think is most important in uh, in considering these discussions about genetically engineered foods. Um, now, I apologize, but for interest of time, I'm going to have to skip my next couple of slides. They have to do with genome editing, and I'd love to answer any questions that you might have about genome editing. The most important piece is that this actually expands the tool set that we're actually able to engage in. Genetic engineering has been a fantastic technology, but genome editing takes it the next step forward and expands the range of options that we have. And what you see here are a bunch of different crops that are already in development um, that are uh, expanding the range of options that we normally have had in the past with genetic engineering. So really what I want to, what I hope you've gotten out of this talk is the fact that we've been transforming agriculture, not yesterday, not just 10 days ago, but we've been doing this for thousands of years. And as we continue to expand our range of options and the technologies that are uh, available, we are better able to tackle uh, problems such as uh, food insecurity and hunger to be able to reduce the, our impact on the environment, making more food using less land. Um, and really enhancing our agricultural systems overall. So my last, my last bit is what I started on, which is that I really think that it's important to ask questions. At the heart of science, we really are trying to seek answers. And the only way to get there is to ask questions. And sometimes they're hard. Sometimes it's not easy to get to those answers. But I really want to emphasize that you should be asking questions all the time. Don't believe everything that I've said in this talk just because um, this is, you know, just because I gave a presentation. Feel free to ask questions of what I've presented to you, um, both to me in a few minutes and uh, afterwards. Go and search for answers. But please remember that there is such a thing as expertise. So here we have a scientist who has dedicated a lot of time and energy and thought into particular ideas. And then we have someone on the, on the guy who said, well, someone on Twitter said you're wrong. Um, we, it is good to be able to depend on experts when it is their field. I have a lot of knowledge about agriculture, but please don't ask, ask me about nuclear physics because I'm not going to be able to give you very good answers. And I shouldn't be presenting myself as an expert in that space at all. Um, think about how you ask questions and where you're asking them. What do you trust online? Do you trust Facebook in terms of answers? Do you trust Reddit? Where are you going to learn more about a subject? Places that I might suggest as starting points are PubMed. PubMed might be a little hard to get into to some extent because PubMed is a resource that aggregates research papers from all over the world. And they can be really dense, but they are also the direct products of researchers as they are um, talking about the newest findings that they have. And then Wikipedia, um, is definitely not the last place to look for something, but it is a good curated uh, beginning point where they are able to give links out for trusted sources that you can then use as reference to learn more about something. So I wanna thank you for taking the time to listen to my talk today. And um, please feel free to email me. Um, that is not my state email address. That is my personal email address. And I am more than, uh, uh, I would love to hear from you. So with that, I will end my presentation and uh, leave room for questions. Thank you so much. Thank you, Adam. That was great.
It was really, really interesting to hear about your work. Thank you so much. Yeah, so I have a question to kick us off. Um, mm -hmm. You touched a little bit on climate change and increasing sustainability, mm -hmm. um, utilizing growing genetically modified foods. I wonder if you could elaborate a little bit um, about how specifically we can address climate change with, with these new foods. Oh, yeah, that's a great question. So um, one, one way is, as I noted, there is the ability to have herbicide tolerant crops. So you, uh, what's really nice about this type of situation is A, you're applying fewer herbicides. So that is less chemical residue that's going into the environment. But the, really the most important piece is you're actually reducing tillage. Um, anyone who's worked in a garden might know that at the beginning of the year, you often turn over the, the, the soil to kind of break up the root systems of weeds and other things and provide yourself with easy soil to put um, seeds into. Unfortunately, that actually releases carbon dioxide into the air because carbon dioxide is trapped in the soil. And this can, um, and so when you do it in your garden, it doesn't mean much, but in a farm and to farms across the world, ripping up that soil releases a lot of carbon dioxide into the air and actually contributes to greenhouse gas emissions. And so by moving to a system where you don't have to till, which can be encouraged in using an herbicide tolerant crop, um, you can reduce the amount of greenhouse gases that are being emitted. In addition, there are also uh, genetically engineered crops that are being designed to actually have even more carbon sequestration. As you may remember, carbon dioxide is turned into the building blocks for plants. And so there are systems where they are developing plants that um, make even more extensive root systems and store even more of that carbon under the ground as roots. So that's one way that at least climate change is being addressed by the use of these types of crops. Mm, that's fascinating. And it's interesting that within the growing of the foods, we're solving the problem. Hopefully. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that's certainly yeah. A, they're trying to do that. So how did you get into this work in the first place? I know you told us that you love food. Um, how did you turn that into a science career? That's a great question. So as I said, I have my PhD in biochemistry and molecular biology from, the, from uh, Michigan State University. Um, and in my undergraduate research, I actually was looking at um, uh, plant cells and their chloroplasts and how they actually function and how they're put together. For my PhD, I made a little bit of a detour and I moved actually into biohydrogen production. Um, and so it took me away from agriculture for a little bit. But um, I, um, I'm i working in the State Department, not actually as an official federal employee. Um, I am a science and technology policy fellow through the American Association for the Advancement of Science. And so also known as the AAAS. And this program enables people with uh, advanced science degrees to be able to work in the federal government and gain a better understanding of how the government works while also bringing our technical capabilities and expertise to um, wherever we happen to be serving. And so when I was going through the process, I uh, interviewed with the Agricultural Policy Office at the State Department and found that a lot of my goals related to sustainability and environmental change aligned well with those within the office. Um, and so we matched well, and I've been with them since October of 2019. And mm -hmm. uh, uh, I'm having a great time, and I should be with them through the end of 2021. So it's, it's, a, it's been an amazing experience so far. That's fascinating. Again, it's back to solving the world's problems through food. I think it's uh, great. Hopefully. <laughs> yes. Um, so I did have another question kind of based on your last slide. And mm -hmm. then um, we'll, so we'll kind of turn back to that. You talked about getting information from the right sources. Um, mm -hmm. I think that in talking about genetically modified foods, there has been a lot of controversy and potentially misinformation. A lot of people who either do strongly or don't strongly support the movement. Mm -hmm. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about um, how your work kind of touches on navigating people's opinions of this movement. Yeah, that's a that's a great question. So, um, as I stated, stated, the State Department 
works in the international space. So I'm not really typically speaking to organizations or um, others within the, the United States itself. I'm communicating with partner countries and international organizations such as uh, the United Nations and some of their part, uh, part of their um, their chain of different organizations underneath them, such as the Food and Agriculture Organization, obviously. Um, and it can be a distinct challenge uh, to have these conversations, especially if someone already has a particular set of beliefs. Um, the first thing that I emphasize is that we're not talking about telling a country that they should be using a certain technology. Instead, we're having a discussion about the range of technologies that are available and that when they are being considered to think about it in a scientific way, to be expanding beyond um, uh, con uh, these uh, possibil possibilities that people introduce that are not steeped in science. And instead, all the decision making really should be going back to studies, to uh, research on the actual effects of these products. And um, the, the second piece is really to talk about the opportunities and benefits that these products can actually uh, be utilized for. Um, that we have many, many, many different challenges in agriculture as uh, we've touched on briefly in my presentation today. And so how can we solve those problems? If we are having problems with a particular type of pest, um, let's uh, give an example in uh, Africa right now, they have a real uh, difficult time dealing with a pest called fall armyworm, and it's been destroying their crops. Uh, after fall armyworm goes through, sometimes they don't have any crop at all um, because they're voracious and just eat through everything. Um, we actually have fall armyworm here in the United States, but we don't have problems with it. And Part of that is because of climate and because of in, it's an invasive species in Africa, but also we have pest management strategies that can address fall armyworm, which are not necessarily present everywhere in Africa. So one way that can be this can be addressed is through the use of pesticides. You can spray your crops to try to eliminate this uh, uh, the ability for this pest to infiltrate your corn or your cassava or your wheat. But then you're spraying a lot of pesticides. It's expensive and this goes into the environment. And you're also um, possibly exposing yourself to these chemicals. Um, and some people don't always use the best chemicals with that are high quality and safe for use. Um, so that's but pesticides are definitely a strategy. There's also the use of um, crops such as the BT crops that I, that I talked about before, which are insect resistant because they produce basically their own insecticide inside of themselves. Um, so we talk about the range of options, not necessarily saying that one is better than the other. Mm -hmm. Does that answer your question? Yeah, it absolutely does. Um, it sounds like it's sort of sharing education and explaining that there are different solutions for different problems is one way to navigate some misinformation and confusion. Mm -hmm, definitely. So we have an audience question that sort of relates to what you were talking about, um, but on the consumer level now, what are some things that we can do as consumers to help support more environmentally friendly food production? That is an excellent question, question Spencer. Um, and I'll, I'll, I'll first say that this is not my forte. This is not where I typically engage. But I think one of the most important things at any point when being a consumer is to make sure that you're informed, to ask questions. So when you see a label um, that might say organic or might say GMO free um, or produced in this particular way, um, it's good to uh, learn what that actually means and how it applies to, um, uh, applies to you and the money that you're spending. So um, it's good to understand the types of production methods that are useful for sustainability and enhancing our environment. And uh, connecting that to your dollar can be really useful. Um, but I, I really encourage people to just learn more about it um, uh, because there, there, is, there can be confusion. And you know, seeing a label say one thing doesn't necessarily mean uh, what you might think it means. Uh, I guess I'll, the, the briefest example I'll give is um, I've seen bottles of non-GMO water 
And some people might recognize that as being a little silly because water doesn't have DNA in it. And if it doesn't have DNA, then it can't be genetically modified. And the, so the entire reason that a non-GMO sticker on that bottle is there is because some people associate that with higher quality or safety. Mm. But understanding what that sticker actually means lets you know that that um, this uh, that this water is not necessarily any better for you than any other type of water. Um, in terms of uh, other things that you can be doing is um, encouraging your lawmakers to make uh, decisions that are based in science and uh, performing evaluations that are going to be rigorous but transparent and uh, ultimately shift the conversation towards a more environmentally set sustainable practice. Um, and uh, I also like to buy local. We can't all buy local and we can't necessarily say that everyone in the world should because it's not necessarily uh, available to everyone. But when, uh, when possible, I try to buy local and that can have positive effects. Although it's, it can be difficult because you don't necessarily know where that food came from. So that's a great question, Spencer, and I'm sorry I can't answer it a little bit better. I think you answered it perfectly. You gave us a couple different points to think about. That's great. Um, also on the consumer level, Lara is asking, how do you choose healthy products, especially since there are so many ingredients in most products? Going back to nope. the Impossible Burger again. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Um, I think really at the end of the day, it's not about uh, products that are healthy necessarily. It's about um, moderation um, and making sure that you have a uh, diversity in the types of foods that you eat. So eating the occasional uh, Impossible Burger can be just fine for you. I'll tell you that it has marginal, marginally, uh, it has a slightly higher nutritional content than a typical burger. But at the end of the day, it's not a uh, healthy food product because, I mean, it's overly processed. There's a lot of different components in it. Um, but having that occasionally is not a bad thing. Um, it's about moderation and about diversity. To have a very health, uh, healthful diet, it's good to have a variety of vegetables and uh, fruits in your diet. Um, limit your calorie intake. So look at, uh, look at a label and see... Does it, it how, uh, what percentage of your uh, average daily intake is it actually occupying? I, I gave you that label for uh, Oreos. I'm fairly certain if you have 10 Oreos, you've probably gotten to halfway your calorie intake for a day. So it's good to be aware of those labels and to think about it, maybe not in a, like very strictly where it's like, okay, I have to have just 2000 calories a day, but to be uh, conscious of what you're eating and in what amounts. Um, but at the end of the day, I wouldn't say that necessarily any one food is, should be, should be taken off of your diet. It's about moderation and diversity. Mm, that makes a lot of sense. And I do have to ask you, Adam, just a silly question because we've talked so much about food. What is your favorite food? Um, I shouldn't admit it, but it's bacon. Um, <laughs> it's, and, Talking about moderation, I only have it like once a month and I'll have like three slices, but yeah, that it's, it's delicious. And I know that having large amounts is not good for me. How about oh, you, God. Leah? What's your oh, favorite? Ooh, um, I was not expecting to be questioned. I, I am a sucker for pasta. I do love pasta. And oh, nice. much like you, I try not to eat too much of it because mm -hmm. it's not not too great yeah. for you. <laughs> it's just, just a lot of calories all in one place, unfortunately. Yes. So to wrap us up, um, I would like to ask Adam, where do you see your work going in the future? Are you talking about the work that I'm currently doing or where I see my mm -hmm. career being? Hmm. Uh, let's talk about your research. What's the future of your research? Well, um, I, I, I uh, hope I wasn't giving the wrong impression. I don't do research, not at all. Um, I haven't done research since 2015. Um, what I do in uh, currently is I uh, I have discussions about um, uh, genetically engineered crops, and I'm really trying to change the, the conversation um, in a variety of different places around the world. Um, and so it's a, 
an ongoing interesting challenge and um, things are constantly flying at me. Um, mm -hmm. And it, it's, it's difficult to try to explain in the short amount of time that we have. Um, overall, I would like to stay in the policy world, especially in the environmental context um, and talk to talk about sustainability, to talk about resiliency, to talk about how we as humans have to adapt to our changing climate because um, all of the methods that we go through right now may mitigate the changes, but they're not necessarily going to take us back to where we were 100 years ago. And so I'd like to stay in that space, um, especially talking to partners across the world about the ways that we can act in a very intentional manner to um, address these challenges that we face. Mm. Well, you're doing very relevant work and we really appreciate you sharing with our students what your work is. So thank you, Dr. Adam Cornish for joining us today. Well, thank you for having me. I certainly appreciate it. So for those of you watching, uh, Lunch with a Scientist is designed to show you what a STEM career looks like. Today we heard from Dr. Adam Cornish. If you are a scientist or know of one that would like to present to our students, please get in touch with us. And with that, we will wrap up. Adam, I hope you have a great day. Thank you so much. Have a good one. You too.